family mode. Morning, everybody. It's uh, Thursday, May 31st, the last day of May. And this is Gil with Dr. K coming at you. Uh, Dr. K, you're still sitting there in Cannes, France. Is that where you're at? Uh, no, I'm in London at the moment. Oh, you're back. Okay, so you headed back to London. All right. I hope Cannes was fun. Uh, anyways, uh, let's take a look at the, this market here. Take a look at the NASDAQ index. You, you basically can see what's going on. You had a breakdown here. You, find, you undercut these lows in here. You, you basically, the, the NASDAQ index kind of stops in midair, but it's not clear to us whether uh, that means you're going to bounce very far, you're going to roll over. But the one thing to notice here is if you're into technical analysis 101, uh, you had a little ascending wedge type formation yesterday. You gapped below it on heavier volume, and today again you're moving lower, and we're running at higher volume rates on the day. So, you know, bearish action. It tends to argue for a test of 200-day moving average, which would undercut this low, of course, and that might set up a bounce. So we're watching that very carefully. But right now, the market direction model is on a sell signal. So if you're playing it on the short side, uh, the the signal is still in, in the direction uh, of the bear, shall we say? Uh, this morning we did get a buy signal. Well, let me get let me get rid of the indexes here. So you can see we're looking for a test of the 200-day moving average on the major market indexes. But if we look at say uh, the UVXY, you got a buy signal on that this morning, right up to opening. So we covered you covered the short position in UVXY, and I guess you go long UVXY. Now I've been using my own uh, method to trade this myself on an intraday basis, and I don't hold the position overnight. I'm not going to get into that because it is my method, and my view is if you have a method that works, there's no reason to uh, try to pedal off to the world and just use it to make money yourself. That's especially with this thing because this thing is nuts, uh, and I think you do have to be very active uh, with it. So right now, when we run this, we're actually using uh, the model itself in terms of the general direction of the UVXY, which is uh, on a buy signal right now. And in terms of how we enter and exit the positions and trade them, uh, we use a short-term method that I've imposed. But I think if you're going to do something like that, because we're trying to run a more aggressive position in the UVXY to take advantage of the big moves, because you'll notice intraday you can get some very sharp moves that are very playable, and then it tends to go into, uh, you know, same thing here, very sharp move to the upside. You notice in the morning you had a nice move to the upside. And then it, at some point during the day, it tends to go sideways for a long period of time. It'll bore you to death, uh, especially if you get a bunch of excitement early in the morning. It's going to bore you to death for the rest of the day. But uh, if you're going to play it aggressively, I think you do have to be active and you have to be watching this pretty closely because this thing can move. And I'm sure if you're playing it, you already know that. Uh, it can move very quickly. So, But that's what makes it so much fun. In any case, uh, so that's what we're playing right now as far as the... Uh, uh, index ETFs or the ETFs go. Uh, my favorite short right now is of course LinkedIn. You had a little reverse flag right in here. Try to get back above uh, the 50-day moving average last week and then yesterday you had an upgrade from Citigroup and uh, you know you will have to forgive me but I'm a cynic and having come from the institutional side of the business I to me I think Citigroup all they did is they told their analysts to put a buy on the stock with a 125 price target because they got somebody uh, a client that they're trying to get business from uh, once unloads some shares, so they oblige them by putting a uh, a buy signal on it. Now, of course, I can't prove any of that, but that's always been my impression because it seems like a pretty lame time uh, to be putting a buy signal on LinkedIn when you have Facebook getting its brains beaten in. And the whole question of how these social networking companies are going to monetize uh, their existing businesses and the existing stream of users and alleged mass of uh, subscribers like Facebook claims they have 900 million users, active users, but you have to remember what they call and classify an active user as somebody who just clicks once on the like button or the like, uh, whatever you call it, uh, the like thingy, I guess you could call it, uh, and now they're an active user. So in terms of using that number to measure what the opportunity is for them, that's another question, but they're definitely going to have to do battle with Google going forward. And Google is a master at monetizing uh, their various user streams, I guess you might call it. Uh, but in any case, I think LinkedIn uh, becomes a prime candidate to shore here. And of course, we were talking about it closer up in here around between the 65-day exponential and the 50-day simple moving average. You notice yesterday it couldn't get any farther than the 
uh, magenta 10-day moving average. So right now I'm kind of using that as a trailing uh, upside stop on the position. Although one could consider this area in here. Let me get my little pen going here. You could consider this to be uh, also the lows of this pattern, and that's now broken through that. So I would tend to look at this as being potential resistance so you can drop your trailer trailing stop down a little lower if you want to. If you're the type of uh, trader who can take a position in a smaller position and try to sit through the move all the way down, theoretically I'd like to see it get down to the 200 day moving average, which I think is doable when you look at other patterns in this market that look similar. Uh, for example, let's see. <clears throat> I had a weekly chart around here. There it is. I see uh, LinkedIn to me is a what I would call a oh, heck. Look out. <clears throat> Gotta stop this guy from floating. That's the problem. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Big IPO type of pod formation. And again, remember last week I was talking about this idea that you had the social networking ETF started up at the in, in uh, November, December, January. I guess I starting into November, but you start saw it start to move up because you're probably uh, initiating uh, this ETF. And of course, remember how the uh, the one, the Sky one, uh, which was cloud computing, drove a lot of these uh, clouds up the right side of patterns, such as TIBCO, such as CRM, such as VMware, and so on. And you wonder whether that buying drove these stocks higher. So uh, kind of extrapolating that to LinkedIn and this uh, SOCL, or Social Networking ETF, I asked myself, was all of this buying just that? or And are they dragging in other people getting excited uh, about the uh, stock given the upcoming Facebook IPO and as it turned out the Facebook IPO is nothing but a big fizzle and so all of that hype and wonderful new glorious era of making millions of, of dollars trading uh, social networking stocks kind of got blown out the window and I think of course that brings LinkedIn into question so I think this thing could head at least to the 200 day moving average longer term maybe down to the lows at 60 you know what is it really worth the market will tell you. So you just watch the price volume action. For now, the price volume action is showing you, you have a breakout to the downside. I mean, you can even turn this upside down and some in inverted cup with handle, or you could say it's a little tiny head and shoulders. I tend to look at it as a big late stage failed pod, and so the 50 day moving average becomes your sort of overhead ceiling, and so you operate on that basis. Uh, until proven otherwise, and so I think you're at least headed there. So other stocks that look similar, of course, that we talked about, CRM is another one that we're campaigning, kind of another pod, and of course here's a daily chart. Looks like you're headed for the 200-day moving average. That would undercut this low, and that seems very, very logical uh, right there. So in any case, um, I think these probably do what F5 has done what VMware has done in terms of breaking down. So that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Uh, let's see. Dr. Hay, do you have any comments on the model in general? Uh, no, just uh, sitting in uh, on its sell signal. We're in a concerted downtrend in uh, European markets as well as in the U.S. market. I think uh, with this slew of negative news out of Europe, with U.K. in a recession, um, we're going to see more bad news to come in the form of... Um, uh, economic uh, indicators out of Europe and the US uh, because all these markets are fairly well connected so you could even go back into the 19th century interestingly and, and you'll notice that when one country has one major country has a recession the others tend to follow and correlate to quite a high degree so uh, yeah I'm uh, let's hope for a continued downtrend that's uh, you know somewhat uh, uh, s somewhat non-volatile so we can ride it down with the rest of the market? Yeah, I, I tend to think the market, we're, we're in terms of the backdrop for the market, when you think about it, and uh, there are actually a couple of emails we've received from members who also see the same thing. When you look at historical market environments, you have one that is highly unusual. You, number one, you have a world where the Fed and other central banks have kept interest rates near 0% for three years now you have an attempt at an economic recovery and of course they tell you the government statisticians and the uh, the sheep in the media I think all tell you that we're in the third year of an economic recovery but the fact is if that's the case this is 
by far the weakest economic recovery in recorded history, and it's even weaker than the recovery we saw during 1933 to 1936 uh, during the Great Depression. So it, it, economically things are very weak, and it doesn't look like things are going to pick up. Even if you look at the Fed's own forecasts from last year, they were looking for 4% 4, 4 plus growth, uh, economic growth, GDP growth in uh, 2012 this year, and we'll be looking if we get half of that. Uh, and for 2013, they were looking for more than 4%, and uh, they're revising their estimates for 2013 somewhere south of 3%. So, you know, but usually by the second or third year of a so called economic recovery, which uh, we're told we're in, uh, you're usually getting over 5% growth, and so you haven't gotten anywhere close to that. And so, if you think about this, when you have the amount of stimulus being provided by governments worldwide, and of course, the U.S. with its stimulus, which is far beyond anything we've ever seen by many magnitudes of scale, uh, you're still getting this incredibly feeble growth. So one thing I think we can count on is the Fed keeping rates near zero. ZERP is here to stay probably, at least they say, until 2014. And that's probably why you continue to see uh, bonds uh, have money flowing in. The TLT today, right, Dr. K, you were mentioning this earlier, uh, is uh, going bonkers. And so you see a huge fear bid in the... Uh, in treasuries, and that's uh, and I think that continues to be the case until you see the Fed start to do something else with interest rate policy. So you can pretty much count on interest rate policy staying near zero zero percent. I think they're going to be pulling out the uh, printing presses again very soon, and so I'd be looking for that. And that may start to turn the market around. That's really where the real question is. I was reading a report this morning that some of the uh, some analysts and maybe he makes sense, maybe he doesn't, says that uh, investors will panic when they realize that the Fed has no power. Their policy no longer works. They're essentially pushing on a string. And I suppose we'll see that if and when it happens. So but you can see the market as we're talking now is trying to rally back. And so uh, pushing back to the upside. So it remains volatile. The market remains very volatile here. And I tend to think given all of the bizarreness uh, that we see and, and the situation, you know, worldwide, globally, debt exceeds 100% of uh, global GDP right now when you combine it also. You know, the world's underwater, the U.S., Europe, they're all underwater. And how do they get out? They're going to print. And uh, so how with how that outcome plays out in the markets is another question, and we'll just have to see. Yeah, there's also, um, you know, you're citing the statistics that are that are showing that we're not uh, really in a proper recovery. Um, but those statistics also are quite exaggerated. I think that the statistics are being painted, and even though they're being painted and manipulated, the Fed, the, the government still can't make uh, a case where we're having a proper recovery that right. is equivalent to prior recoveries, which which tells you tells you how bad the situation really is. Um, you know that unemployment rate of eight point one percent in the U.S. that's that's just a joke. Yeah. Um, you know we know how they they manipulate. The, for instance, when people just give up trying to look for work, they don't get counted as unemployed anymore, which is kind of ludicrous to me. Uh, the CPI number, of course, is always manipulated as well. If you get certain instruments that are skyrocketing in value, they get removed from the CPI. So the CPI will therefore not accelerate as quickly as it probably should. Um, and, and, you know, these countries, these debtor countries, uh, they go through generally five stages. But I'll be just, I'm going to give you a real brief on, you know, we're in stage, uh, probably stage uh, four to five right now. And stage four is where countries become poorer and still think of themselves as rich. Um, and I would say I think that categorizes the U.S., the U.K., and, and Europe. Um, stage five is where countries go through deleveraging and a relative decline, which they're very slow to accept. And I think that's, you know, we've moved from four at stage four into stage five, and we being the debtor nations, U.S., U.K., and Europe. Dr. K, can I interject something here? Yeah, I thought it was funny. Yesterday somebody was talking about we should punish Pakistan by withholding the billions of dollars of aid that we send to them uh, every year for, for arresting the doctor who helped us catch bin Laden. And, and it just struck me as it's the height of hubris when a government can with, talk about withholding money that they're going to give to Pakistan as aid when it's money that they're borrowing from China. You know, and, and so there is, like you're saying, they pretend, we, we pretend we're wealthy here in the United States, but we're not. We're poor, we're underwater, we're in debt. And we don't want to admit it. I think at some point you kick the can down the road so far, eventually the markets force you to change your behavior one way or another, and it may not be pretty in the end. But anyway, someone mentions That's here. The, real quick, the, markets. the markets will yeah, always force, force government's hands. 
Dr. K, somebody says, uh, Ro uh, Rohit asks, uh, have you gotten a chance to read the new Market Wizards book? Best one yet. I think on the plane coming back from Vegas, you were reading a, an advanced copy of that uh, to write yeah. a re review. Yeah, I, uh, Jack, <laughs> Schwager is, is not. Jack Schwager is uh, one of my favorite authors uh, when it comes to uh, writing on uh, the stock markets. And I read um, Market Wizards in, I think it was 1989, right about the time That's I was reading cool. Bill O'Neill's book. And it was uh, it was really changed my thinking. It really put me on track. And since then, I've read all of Jack Schwager's books. I think he's an amazing writer. And uh, this this book, uh, Wiley and Son sent me advanced reading copy. They wanted me to write a, uh, a review on it for um, the actual book that's going to go to press. And I was more than honored to be able to do so. And uh, I got to say, this is it, this this work of his uh, is just as good. Um, as any of his other works. I mean, it's just classic Jack Schwager, and I highly recommend that anyone uh, out there who is interested yeah. in investing go out and buy it when it's available. Yeah, definitely. I'm reviewing another book, and I can't remember the title, but they've sent me another book to read and review. So hopefully I'll get around to that one of these days. Not like we don't have enough to do around here. Anyways, uh, let's see. What about gold? People ask about gold. Uh, maybe gold has bottomed. You know, I'm kind of watching gold here. Yesterday gold was up. Uh, despite the stocks being down, and I think it tells you that you might be getting some sort of clue as to a QE. I think if they do print money, if they start printing, fire up the printing presses, uh, trying to support the system in, in Europe and wherever else problems prop up, uh, and stem a, uh, a route in, in securities markets, I think uh, that will send gold higher. And I think that, that will definitely trigger a higher move in gold. So that may be telling you here as it diverges slightly from stocks, uh, over the last day, really, whether uh, that is going to come come about. So we'll ju we'll just have to see what happens when the uh, when if and when there is an announcement. But you know, I don't know. It looks to me like uh, Europe is sort of stuck stuck between a rock and a hard place, Doctor K. And and you know, they have Spain to deal with. And while Spain may be too big to fail, it also seems like for Europe at least, it's too big to save. In other words, they don't have the money. Is that right? Well, they. <laughs> Spain doesn't have the money to save itself, but but the ECB can come in and, and I mean if, they, if Germany if Germany doesn't Germany of course is taking a very uh, austere position, and so they're really reluctant to print money. But Germany also doesn't want these countries to leave the euro because it's to their advantage for these countries to stay. Right. So but they can't have it both ways. So I think what'll happen, uh, and this is just conjecture, but as as one of these countries really looks like it's on the edge about to fall. Germany will probably loosen up some of its purse strings and, and print some money just just to buy some time to keep them in the euro, and and right. we might see this kind of tug of war going on play, playing out over the next you know many months. Right, and we'll see whether they end up uh, issuing euro bonds. But I, I think you got to keep an eye on gold as a clue here. Uh, and if you want to try and buy it here, we were talking about this yesterday that if you're a bottom fisher in gold, then here's where you would probably buy it and you could buy the GLD using the lows as a quick stop and that's really like one or two or three percent I think max and and so uh, you know you're pretty in a pretty good risk reward position in terms of dealing with that and so I think that's something uh, that could be considered if you think we're going to get QE3 and you can see here that uh, markets trying to turn green again so not looking pretty good so in terms of uh, uh, the QE factor, and again, that's what makes these markets so volatile. And I think they're difficult to trade. So I think you got to watch things carefully and uh, and be willing to uh, to move when necessary. So, anyways, we'll see how this pans out today. But I wouldn't be surprised. You got heavy selling. You, this could be all over the place, and we'll just have to see what happens. Tomorrow's job summer is maybe already baked in the cake, but we'll just have to see what happens there as well. Okay, what else? Um, Here's a few stocks. People want to go over stocks. I mean, I don't really see what there is to go over on them. I think they're all. You don't want to buy them. Uh, I don't really have anything to say here other than this is just a breakdown and heading for the 200 day moving average. Uh, Green Mountain Coffee, uh, you know, it's down and dirty and looks like it wants to go lower. So don't really have anything to say there either. Netflix, uh, same thing. So not quite sure what I'm supposed to tell you here, but these are going down and like the market everything looks pretty damn ugly. So uh let's see. What's your take on the dollar, Dr. K? Well it's the uh tallest standing midget, so there's been a flight to quality uh as witnessed uh by the 
rise in the price of the dollar and also um, the rise in uh, treasuries. And those are the two tallest standing midgets. So, uh, you know, if they if things get worse in Europe, I, I expect to see TLT and uh, and UUP, as represented by the dollar, uh, continue to rise. Of course, these things can't go up forever, and I, I think at some point Europe will get some sort of respite, and that'll be in the form of maybe some dead cat bounces in the market. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good good question here. Based on your earlier comment on trading the UVXY and not sharing with the world your strategies that work, what does that say about your past and pending publications that you have shared? It doesn't say anything. I mean, the market direction model, you can decide whether that works or not by looking at the historical data that's published on the website. End of story. In terms of new things that I'm developing in the market that are on the cutting edge of my own work, I don't see why I need to share those with everybody. And frankly, if they make me a lot of money, why aren't I allowed to keep some things to trade my own way? Or fifty-nine ninety-five, I'm supposed to divulge everything that I do and every way that I do it? I don't think so. You're gonna have to pay me a lot more, and I think that the money I make in the markets uh, would far exceed what most of you would be able to pay me if, if, if you really wanted to uh, see some of the methods I use. Because I frankly don't think most of you could stomach some of the drawdowns that I have to deal with. But I'm used to dealing with it, uh, and I can make a lot of money on my own. So you know, that's pretty much that story. Uh, and I don't don't mean to sound uh, say uh, oh I heard a great word snarky about it, but uh, that's pretty much the bottom line. So, anyways, but I think my personal view is, and Dr. K and I argue over this. When it comes to the UVXY, I think it's something that you have to actively trade. I don't think necessarily you want to sit there and buy a big position and try to ride a trend because you're going to have to sit through some major percentage uh, swings in it. Yeah, so and that, that's, that's why you have to mitigate the position size uh, for this model to be tradable. And, of course, that's what I've illustrated that, you know, 10%, maximum 20% position sizes, I think, are, uh, you know, manageable uh, for a number of investors. But there's still going to be some that can't even manage a 10% position because, you know, these things are pretty wild. But yeah, uh, so. but you know that said, this is something that I, I mean I'm when I when I share uh, ideas and when I whether I'm sharing it with just a, a private group of people or I share it on you know through a book or through virtual soft investing, it helps me really get the idea on track is what I've noticed and this is true over the years um, well before you know the book or VSI just talking to people and sharing the ideas and being you know completely open about it. Um, gets my thing, even if they don't have anything to contribute to my idea, just expressing it to someone often is what is needed to fine-tune the idea so it does become profitable on a risk-reward basis over a long period of time. And that's what I'm doing right now with the UVXY. It is in beta testing mode and I would hope that it's going to prove itself like some of these other uh, methodologies have proven themselves over the years. Yeah, and, and I have to, you know, we should tell them that I do give you a bad time about the model, don't I, all the time. Uh, and and that I helps. <laughs> that. Yeah, I mean, I call it I call it statistical hubris, the statistical hubris model, because I think it kind of points to this idea that er every problem in the market can be solved by a statistical study, and I don't necessarily think that's the case, but, you know, I'm not also saying that that's how the approach to the UVXY is, is occurring. I just think that it's really a short-term vehicle, almost a day trading vehicle, and I want to use a system myself that employs uh, those sorts of observations that I'm making in terms of its movements, you know. So, uh, so I'll handle it a little bit a bit differently, but I'm trading the the bejesus out of it uh, on a daily basis. I've, I've used I've ran I've ran it um, a number of ways. I've used it as it, it's being shown on Virtuous Option Investing, which is a short-term model, but capable of, of staying with a trend, generally an uptrend, not a downtrend. Um, yeah. And that that's been immensely profitable on back tests. Now it needs to prove itself out in real time. Now just for uh, intellectual purposes, I looked at how it performed against the actual MDM buy and sell signals. Uh, and I went back to, um, you know, I spot checked, but I went back a number of years. What was interesting was um, the, well, if you look at just say 2010 and 2011, which are both very challenging years, uh, 2011, the buy, the uh, sell signals were were immensely profitable to the tune of 300 percent for that year, and the buy signals were about flat. In 2010, it was just flipped, the, just the opposite. The the buy signals were profitable to almost 300 percent, and the sell signals were about flat. But that's good. I mean, I, I think that uh, speaks to the strength of a vehicle like um, 
well, VXX is something that's been around since I think 2009, January 2009. So these uh, things can be back tested with uh, with a fair bit of accuracy. And uh, again, I'm trying to see whether the short term model UVXY model is the is the best ground to take because the profits are qu quite quite extreme versus using the signals with the MDM, which is a slower model. So we're still in beta test. Oh, Gil tells me he's uh I'm back. He's back. He's back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where <laughs> where did he go? And then I just saw your note. Okay, yeah. A little bathroom break there. Um anyways, where are we? Taking a look at a couple of things. The market's starting to turn pretty nicely here, so can't really uh get extremely bearish here, I think. So and you're starting to see some of these things come in in a hurry. So you can see the UVXY breaking down. See, all the way back to where it started the day. And that's my point about this thing is that uh, given the way the market is, and I think you're in a fat tail environment. In other words, if you look at a distribution curve, uh, it's usually a bell-shaped curve. I think you're in a situation where you're in a fat tail of probabilities, where the, the range of potential outcomes uh, is broader than it might normally be uh, in another uh, market environment. And I think uh, because of that, it renders uh, difficulty in trying to approach the market as we might normally. So those are the dangers, I think, inherent in this market. Let's see. Let's go through some other. Anyway, anyways, I hope that all answers the uh, question. Uh, I know Anil has revealed a lot of his methods, but there's also things um, that I observed that he kept to himself. And uh, I don't think that invalidates what he's teaching uh, people. In terms of how to handle the market, I don't think it invalidates what we do either. So, well, you know, I'll also, I wanted to speak to that point. Um, this, the things that O'Neill uses and that we we will use also. Um, a lot of those things, you know, he these are things that many people are going to have a difficult time executing because sometimes, you know, especially with your technique, your technique is really intraday. And yeah. uh, you know, we're not in, we're, we don't want to represent ourselves as intraday guys. We we aren't day traders per se. This is an unusual market environment and I think that Gill's method works pretty well on an intraday basis but um, you know we want to just keep to the more of the you know intermediate term you know where we're ma making big profits on the sweet spot of uh, stock moves and market moves um, as opposed to intraday uh, moves and and so you know and I know Bill, some of Bill's tricks are that he doesn't share with the retail public are kind of on that they can be uh, on that really outside the box uh, exceptional circumstance where the market is in an unusual situation. So, but yeah. by him sharing it with the retail public, we just add a lot of confusion to what he's known for, and that that can't be good for you know for for, the, yeah. for his operation. The, mar the market direction model it's been tested, and and there's been a lot of work done on that. So from that perspective, I think that's valid. I think the UVXY is a whole different thing. It represents more of the cutting edge of what you're doing, and then I've gone and taken that, and uh, you know, I said, wow, this actually is an interesting thing to uh, observe how it trades, and so I decided to use a, a short-term method. The thing, though, about my short-term method is that it, it can change in real time. In other words, if I start to observe different patterns in the way the thing acts around intraday moving averages and, and intraday other intraday indicators, and that's really what I'm trying to put together. Uh, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to go into it because as Billy, my trader, was telling me this morning, he says, if you go do that, you're going to have so many questions and, and people are going to be so confused that uh, just blow it off. So you can all blame him. But uh, you know, he also has a point. He says, if it's making money for you uh, and you know how to handle it, why do you need to reveal it to the world? So, so that's all to say that I think the fact that we do keep a lot of stuff to ourselves still, and maybe that will be forthcoming in the future in future books, you know, we do have to keep some material fresh for future books, at least I, I think our publisher would agree on uh, that, right, Dr. K? Uh, I think that actually validates our methods because uh, we're constantly pushing and trying to improve and, and always acting and conducting ourselves as students of the market primarily because really that's all we are and I can tell you for sure we definitely screw up. I'm going to guess at least as much as both of you uh, do. The only thing is we probably don't get too down in the mouth about it and we are able to come back. Anyways, getting back on track here. Uh, is TSCO a shortable uh, stock? Well, let's just define it in terms of a stock that has had a huge, uh, huge price move already. Where's your weekly chart there? Now you can see here TSCO big, big price move. 
uh, trying to break out of this sort of bizarre looking pattern with one, two, three uh, breaks to the downside through the 50 day, one more rally out trying to get to new highs, and now you blow through the 50 day on huge volume. Okay, there's your late stage failure. So I think you would say that this is a late stage fail base. So now what you're looking at is potentially rallies up to the uh, 50-day moving average around 95, 96. Could go a little further is what you would be looking to short. Now, you remember my methods, I'm always using on the short side the 50-day simple, which is the blue line here, and the 65-day exponential, which is the black line. And I kind of tend to look at this as a zone of resistance, and it can, you know, get just about, uh, you know, a little bit above the top of it or come up into the 65-day exponential. So you might watch it when it gets up in here. Uh, if you're really bold, you could think this thing's really going to blow to the downside and you want to get all excited uh, over this and, and short it here. Well, you, you see how you get a little undercut of these lows here. Now, that engenders a little bit of a rally. The volume is pretty decent, uh, so it's hard to say how far it's going to carry, but it could roll over from here and head for the 200-day. That is a possibility, but you do have this area of uh, res uh, support action on this little flat, basey type thing over here. Uh, and I would tend to think I'd rather short this thing into a rally. On the other hand, the other thing to keep in mind here is I think the average daily volume is uh, somewhere around, right around a million shares. So in terms of the type of liquidity, uh, I like to see it just barely cuts it. And having traded TSC on the long side a few times, it's somewhat illiquid in that you do get these, it's sort of price point illiquidity. In other words, you come in and, and you've got 5,000 shares to cover, uh, at, on one single order, you're going to jack it, you know, 50 cents. So you got to. So if I'm going to run big size, you know, 10, 20 thousand shares, it's very hard for me to deal with that. And if you have a smaller account, I think it's something you can go after. But if you're doing, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 thousand share positions on these, or you're trying to, uh, I think you need much more liquidity. And, and particularly, what I would refer to as price point liquidity. In other words, you guys know what I'm talking about. You go and you put your market order in for a thousand shares of X, Y, Z and the thing moves 15, 20 cents. And, and you can see your order getting filled at the peak and then it starts to drift back in. You, you have to work these things and I don't really want to have to sit there uh, messing around on the order machine uh, doing that. I want to be able to go boom, boom, boom and cover or then boom, boom, boom and short. And so I think, keep, keep in mind, you just want to use a, what I would call a boom, boom, boom strategy uh, that's consistent with your account size. So if you can run positions in anything that allow you to go boom, boom, boom and you're out or boom, boom, boom and you're in, uh, with the with the size position you're trading given your account size and I think you're okay uh, if you got to uh, spend some time messing with them and you push a lot then maybe you're in the wrong stock you should be trading a more liquid stock but a million shares is my minimum this barely meets it and and the way it trades on a price point basis doesn't make me too excited about trading it um, anyways <clears throat> Uh, so as Dr. K's beta model struggles, why would you say anything all about how you're making a killing in the UVXY? I'm saying I'm, I'm making some pretty good money in it, so wouldn't you want to keep that to yourself as you do the method? No, why should I? <laughs> I have a big ego, you guys, come on. At least allow me that much, okay? <laughs> LGF is a pocket pivot today, exactly. I, that was actually on my list of things to talk about, and a uh, nice rounded cuppy pattern. Dr. K, were you going to say something? Uh, no, no, keep going. All right. Uh, and you do have a pocket pivot, but negative earnings growth. Uh, so not much else really to say about that. But uh, it doesn't over, would it override the basic market sell signal? Well, if you want to buy it, you, know, you can override it yourself with the idea that you're going to stop yourself out if the market rolls back over or this thing rolls back over. So you don't need to have some sort of macro green light that says, yes, it is okay to buy this. But hey, Dr. K, would you buy this? <laughs> Well, that, that, that would normally be a rhetorical question. In this kind of market environment um, and this kind of pattern, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not enough of a leading stock to me that it could potentially buck a market downtrend. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, did Portfolio Simulator dude have a death in the family? Not a peep in quite a while. He, like many Americans, uh, at least Americans who participate in the stock market, he's really gone sour on the, on the stock market. So he's kind of staying out. He's become very cynical, somewhat, somewhat of a recluse. Uh, he's been playing a lot of video games lately in the dark. And, uh, and so yeah, I am a little bit concerned about Portfolio Simulator. We may have to send him to a therapist. But uh, for now, he just decided he doesn't want anything to do with stocks. And uh, it's all just a big fixed market run by uh, high-frequency trading programs 
and the, in conjunction with the Fed, uh, and the Democrats and the Republicans are all conspiring to take the country down so they can turn it into a feudalistic system where we all work for the government, uh, mostly uh, trying to turn uh, algae into uh, green energy. Anyways, uh, that's where he's at right now. So, V, is it a short? Let's see. Uh, well, you could look at this also, late stage failed pattern here, so you break down. Again, look at V uh, in this bull market, it's had a big run. And so here you are again, breaking down. You, you initially break down here, notice how it takes some time, and then here it breaks out to the downside and, and undercuts this low, and then turns back up. This actually gives you a pretty good picture of how some of these things can take some time to uh, form out. and. Uh, and there does come a time to short them and they break down. Now, is this shortable here? I would probably be, if I was going to try and short this, which I, I haven't actually, but it is a, a late stage based failure. And you'll notice you have, there are actually a lot of patterns like that right now, which tells you something about the market, I think, as well. But bottom line here is that uh, you're already breaking down, and whether you're going to head for this low, that's a possibility, or the 200 day from here is another question. You could always take a position here with the idea that you're going to stop out at 119. And that is only about four uh, percent or less from here. So you know it's within reasonable risk management if you can deal with a four or five percent loss if you get stopped out. The other side of that is it could stop you out, move just above the 50-day as it did here, and then roll over. So you're going to have to dance with it one way or another, as I like to call it. And that means moving with the trade. Uh, so some of you guys are getting very amused uh, uh, by the conversation. The PSD is very telling of the overall market. Yeah, that's kind of the idea. Some a lot of people asking about PSD. PSD. Yep. He did not buy the Facebook IPO. He's too smart, at least, to do that. So I, I did meet a couple of people who did. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, you know, but uh, PSD, we may have to send him off to uh, some sort of therapy. He's really suffers from, I guess you'd call it uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. I mean, that's really what this market has done to him over the last six months since he started trying to invest. And those familiar with his exploits uh, can probably confirm that. Anyways, let's see. Any more questions, you guys? Everybody seems kind of quiet today. I guess we we just stunned them with our brilliance today, Dr. K. Uh, <laughs> either that, either that, or we baffled them with our bullshit. But uh, I guess we'll, the the price volume action will eventually tell all. In any case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, well, let's see where this market goes. I'm watching this thing kind of bounce around. Let's let's kind of blow these uh, other charts out of the way and just kind of see what's going on in in uh, Gil's uh, monitor land here. You got uh, my positions here. You got the LinkedIn shorts still working. You are undercutting this low, which to me might set up the potential of a little blip to the upside. I'm just kind of watching that today, uh, but I still have a target here, working it down to. Uh, the 200-day moving average. Of course, that's going to depend on what the market does. My thinking, of course, as I discussed at the outset of this webinar, is that I would expect these uh, two stocks that we've been working, LinkedIn and uh, Salesforce, uh, to hit their 200-day moving averages in conjunction with the market testing the 200-day moving average on the NASDAQ and uh, on the S&P index. So that's something I'm watching for. So as you're shorting things, that's the S&P getting a little bit of support off the lows today. Um, I think the NASDAQ may be getting a little bit, yeah, a little bit too as well. So uh, for all you know, this is just a little pullback. You don't know. I mean, it, the, this, it, the whole situation really remains in flux as far as I can tell. And so just remain flexible. And no, that I, goes I, to say, go ahead. I was thinking, um, yeah, about uh, the LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, social networking connection here. Um, you know, we were on Jarkasy talking about uh, our views on Facebook, and we were both pretty negative. Um, but I and I wanted to say that you know, here's the thing with Facebook: it has enormous potential. It does have uh, claimed 900 million users. I think that's probably about right. I mean, it, it, it tends to grow by 100 million every few months. So, uh, based on its growth rate, 900 million sounds about right. So they have a huge audience, uh, probably the largest audience in the world. And, and the question is, what are they going to do to monetize that audience? Um, they, there's a few things that I mentioned that they can do. And they could, it, these are things that could be very effective, potentially. Um, and these are things that Google cannot do. So what right. could happen with Facebook? See, right now, um, the sales and revenues don't look very impressive with the company. And I think it's going to languish for a short. while. Right. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. And I think the issue is obviously price volume action. The technicals always win out in terms of entry and exit points. 
So until we start to see some sort of evidence on the price volume action of Facebook, um, you know, this is this is one not worth uh, not worth touching with a ten foot barge pole. Uh, if if these ideas that I put forth, um, and I and I, I'm sure Facebook is exploring these ideas as well. Uh, if they start executing them and monetizing them, then we will start to see evidence in the form of better fundamental numbers, better sales, accelerating revenues, you know, that, those sorts of things. And we'll also see it reflected in the price volume action of the chart. So until then, there's really no, no discussion on the Facebook, is my, in my view, and, and we're probably not going to be really taking Facebook seriously uh, for a number of months, if not longer. Yeah, and somebody asked about a Facebook short. Uh, I haven't been able to borrow shares, and, and I, I know Ross uh, Haber, who works with us, uh, helping oversee the VMAP program, or the Managed Account program, uh, he was IMing me on this day, the second day, uh, which I think was a Friday. Was it a Friday? Uh, they came public on a Thursday, right? Yeah, that was a Friday. That yeah, he uh, wants a short Friday. Facebook, but he can't borrow any shares, and uh, where, can I, where can he borrow shares? And You know, you would have thought with 400 and 70 something million shares uh, uh, being offered that there would be some to borrow somewhere but there weren't unfortunately and so couldn't really show it but there's no real pattern there so but man that looks nasty would what, what reaction would gold have if the euro crashed with a run on the banks you're saying um, unknown you'd be uh, I, I would think that that'd probably engender some sort of uh, money printing activity and so I think therefore you would be looking at uh, potential for gold to rally. So all you have to do is watch gold and and watch its action and you'll figure out what to do. So anyway, so you can see what I'm talking about here. You get this little undercuts on intraday base. You can see LinkedIn coming in. Some of these other shorts, I think Monsanto is kind of interesting, but may need some more type to, uh, time to develop. Uh, Chipotle Mexican Grill had a pocket pivot a couple days ago. We pointed that out. Now you kind of have an orderly pullback in here. Not sure what that means. CF, uh, notice how it's back above the 200 day, it's settling down on top of the 200 day moving average. I wouldn't be shorting this again here. It may need to go all the way back up to the uh, 50 day moving average. So, anyways, let's see. Google's another one to keep an eye on. I think we've been talking about this one. It has broken the 200 day moving average. Uh, it looks to me like sh it's shortable up between the 200 day and, say, the 600 price level, which is pretty tight, a uh, pretty tight area, only about. Uh, one or two percent maximum there. So, you know, but you're coming down. I, I would expect maybe this low is what you would expect to test here. That's another one I'm looking at. And just watching VMware and the way that the big uh, the big cloud stocks, VMware F5, and uh, have all broken down. And so I, that's why I think Salesforce comes down with them. Jazz is another one to keep an eye on, I think, because that's starting to break its tuna day moving average. This was a notice how we, we shorted this one before and we made some money on it. Bounce off the tuna day roughly, undercut all these lows. So you're covering there, taking your profits. A couple of days later, it's gapping up on earnings. But that turns out to be a late stage failed breakout, and kaboom, we break the uh, 50 day moving average. You rally back up to it, and now it's starting to break down. The only thing I don't like about Jazz, and one reason I don't trade it, uh, if, and if I did, I would trade a very small size, which for me doesn't make it fun enough, um, is because it trades less than a million shares a day, about 890,000 shares a day, which is not what I want to see. I'd like to see more. Um, Melanex, interesting article in IBD, seems not only a potentially but has a great predefined stop below the breakout. I would maybe go a, a little... Uh, further than that, <clears throat> you might say a violation of the 10-day moving average might push you out here, but you did have a, a sort of a pocket pivot, a recovery pocket pivot here, and it's holding the 10-day nicely. So, yeah, this is a nice pattern, and you could also, yeah, use the 55 level as your stop, ultimately. You're going to give it a little porosity because you can see here that that would have been required to keep you in the stock here. And the other question is, do you need to buy these stocks? I do think, though, that it's one to have on your buy watch list. And somebody does ask, so Neil says you got to build a buy watch list during a correction. Yeah, of the things that look okay, and there aren't that many. This is definitely one of them. I think Monster has looked okay in terms of having a pocket pivot here, and it's actually held above that despite all the markets swinging around. Um, Apple, I think, is also interesting because it sets up the possibility of a shakeout plus N, and I think in this case N would probably be 25 points, so a push through 580 probably, and you notice how that's going to take you up to the 65-day exponential, 50-day simple sort of uh, moving average <clears throat> convergence area zone, whatever you want to call it, or as I like to call them, these are Ichigilmo clouds if you color these in, the area between the 65-day and the 50-day, 
and you can see how it's trying to come up. This is a stock I'd watch, and I actually have traded it on an intraday basis, you know, just for points. And I should point out that Livermore uh, often talked about trading stocks for points and taking the position with uh, that exact idea. Uh, and I think in this kind of market, that's more of a, a better uh, situation. So uh, it sounds like somebody's calling me on my cell phone. Maybe that's a publicist. Does Fox want me back? I don't know. <clears throat> Anyways, um, let's go through some more questions here. Pocket pivot thoughts on quadruple W. Uh, well, you have a pocket pivot three days ago. Is that a pocket pivot? Just yeah, it was. I mean, it's okay, but you know, it's a, it's a fifteen dollars stock. I'm not really interested in this market. Uh, what other ones? I mean, other stocks have looked okay. I mean, you know, Fire was looking okay. It's trying to build a base. I mean, these are my little short list right here, actually. You know, this one is trying to hang in there, but I'm not so sure that the recovery in housing is what they say it is. I think it's, uh, uh, the la I think the last constructive number was uh, median or average home prices, selling home prices had increased, but that was mainly because it was on the upper end that increased. People with no money still are in the same situation. They don't have any money to buy houses with. People who have money can be tempted to buy some things that look cheap. So I think, in general, that that is the case. So I understand your reluctance to hold UVXY overnight at 2x, but do you have the same reluctance with XIV at 1x? Uh, I might not myself because the volatility isn't there. So yeah, it's just a matter. But it, you know that would depend on your position size because a 1x XIV at 10% to uh, a 5% uh, UVXY. So. It, that would only be if I'm using it to ramp up the position either way. So it's more a question of uh, not the type of ETF, but the size of the position in terms of your percent exposure given your overall uh, portfolio. So that's kind of where I'm at with that one. How about you, Dr. K? Would you say the same thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the whole thing is I, I like I like to be able to hold onto winning positions uh, for a sustained period of time because that that's always been the dynamic. If you look at my you know, audited returns, all that stuff. You'll see that uh, every so often I get a huge home run, and that more than makes up. You know, that 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 makes my year. Um, and same with the timing model, uh, MDM and UVXY. What I've noticed is UVXY. It's a shorter term model, but and so it's got it's going to have a lot more signals. But that said, there's going to be a lot of these little false signals, and then instead of a two percent loss, they might be six to seven percent losses. But the gains are going to also be commensurate, and the gains, you know, good gains are going to be you know thirty, forty some percent in one signal. So um, that I like that kind of rhythm. That that's how I go by it. And since UVXY is that much more volatile, therefore I my my recommendation and to myself is that I scale down the position size. So instead of you know going 75% long in ETF or 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 long in inverse ETF on the MDM, I might only go uh, and that and we're talking you know 2x or 3x ETFs here. Uh, I might only go you know 15, 20, 30 percent on a UVXY. Right. A couple other stocks here, I think, before we uh, cut it off today. Um, Alexion, well, trying to gap out and it's just kind of hanging out with the market, so you could put that on your buy watch list. The only thing I don't like about this is I know Contra Fund has a big position, and uh, I, I think they probably started to sell some of it. I'd keep an eye on that. I know Contra Fund had a big position, 10% position, Apple, and they sold 10% of that down recently so they were behind some of this selling and I'd be watching some of that so but I, I think Alexion probably looks okay TFM is uh, what is the fresh market yeah it's a big gap up it's kind of a squirrely stock trades 327,000 shares a day so it actually never hits my radar screen how about yours Dr. K? Well it's a, it's a, almost a three billion dollar market cap so um, you know in my universe it, it and it's you know trades on the um, well it's a NASDAQ stock it's in retail it it, it would qualify in normal markets, in the current market environment, um, I'm more strict in terms of uh, liquidity. And this would, I mean, the chart pattern is I don't I don't like the chart pattern enough to trade this one. I, you yeah. know, it, it had a it had a gap up. Um, you know, it's it's it everything has to be really really in alignment with the stock in this kind of environment because we are in a downtrend. Yeah. 
Um, Expedia, yeah, that's still breaking out, so I don't know. I'm not going to buy it here. It's extended. How many stocks do you hold when the market is doing good? Sometimes just one. Dutch K might hold 10 to 20. Yeah, in a, in a good, you know, in a classic bull market, like uh, the last time the window was really nicely open with proper stocks was uh, late, uh, well, late 2006 was, uh, we had a three-month window, which was which was spectacular, and I, I typically juggled between 12 to 16 positions to do that 115% return in those three months, um, using a lot, just buying pocket pivots over and over and over again. Um, you know, just keep force-feeding the money while sitting on, you know, more or less full margin. I remember, I think I was probably between 160 to 200% long, um, on average during that during that period and the window was was perfectly open I mean and since then the window hasn't really been open for that prolonged period there was a two-month window in 2007 and then since then you know as we all know not 2009 was a junk off uh, off the bottom led rally and so I don't count that um, as you know a proper window um, of opportunity right uh, this SXCI and this a buyout somebody's buying them out so am I, am I right is that right talk to me uh, let's see. Let me see the chart. Uh, why do you think they're being bought out? SXCI. That's it. Or was there another one? I, I forget. Let me see. Hold on. No, they're not being. They're trading normally today. Okay. Unless you're talking about LK, nice, LKQX nice or something. No, SXC Health Solutions. So I mean, it's a nice flag formation. So it's just a base. You can put that on your watch list. I, I suppose waiting for a, a buy signal. The last buy signal you had was this sort of pocket pivot. But notice it comes off a little bit of a V shape there, uh, and so it, it doesn't really pan out. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to buy it here. I'm, I'm I'm not looking to get long this market at all, unless it's long to UVXY. Uh, I'm, I prefer to be short, and uh, I already talked about what my short positions are. Here's this is an interesting question. IBD's radio show stated that the top 10 of the IBD 50 has had stellar returns, therefore suggesting to concentrate on those stocks. Do you agree? Uh, I'm, I, I don't know what that means. Does that mean that they're saying you should concentrate on the stocks because they performed well already? So in other words, they're the highest relative strength stocks out there right now. I think a lot of that depends on the position of the patterns. All that is contextual. Are they in late stage formations where they are prone to possibly breaking down? I mean, I, my view is during a correction, you look at the highest relative strength stocks that are holding up the best during the correction. I don't really care what they did previously to that because you also have to account for new leadership showing up, uh, which in every new up leg in the market, you should see some, some new ideas or new situations, newer merchandise showing up. That's my view. So I, I don't really understand w what it is you're trying to say. But I mean, proven leaders, do you want to go where the big money has been going? You know, like if the market turns, is Apple going to turn and, and break out? Yeah, that's where you want to go. I mean, Mellanox, that's probably where you want to go. Monsters, another one like that, um, and so forth. <clears throat> So in that sense, I agree, but I don't. I wouldn't use it just as a blanket sort of uh, criteria. In that, oh well, these you know are the have been the best leaders or performers. Uh, stellar, stellar re returns from these stocks, and that means you just buy them blindly. I think that you have to uh, understand the the uh, context of uh, of the patterns and where the stocks are. Uh, Under Armour trying to break out. I don't know. I'm suspicious of this pattern. I'm not a buyer. A line. Uh, it, it, these guys make the the thing that are what for braces to straighten out your teeth, right, Doctor K? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The, and, they're in, uh, invisible. And I guess they're invisible, and that's their big winning winning system. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess uh, big big earnings, and uh, you know, the last quarter, what were they up? They were up twenty nine. Woohoo, twenty nine percent. I don't know. It's a, it's kind of sloppy. It trades four hundred eighteen, you know, eight hundred fifty four thousand shares a day. It's a little bit thinner. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not really into it. I don't like I, the pattern. I, I like. I look at the pattern uh, going back. Okay, uh, as, quite a as ways. It's very body sloppy. Stage is nine. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I, I, LGN is just. A, I don't like the, what the pattern's done over the you know many many quarters going back. It just doesn't look like it ever gets going. And that yeah, and the gap up. Problem. You know, you had a viable gap up theoretically, and that thing didn't take long to fail. So it doesn't really thrill us. You know, nothing right now on the long side thrills us. So I think if you're interested in in you know what we think about the long side, I think you just wait until we start to see some pocket pivots and socks that we think uh, are viable and should be bought. So that's probably where you'll see it. You know, going off and trying to assess some of these eh, sort of half of this and half that situations. I don't know. So, anyways, that's all I've got. Doctor K, you got anything to add? 
And I think we're good. All right, looking good. We'll see how this market goes. You know, uh, as I said, it's volatile. I think you're in a fat tail environment. In other words, the outcomes, the probability of different outcomes is maybe beyond what we uh, have seen historically because you are in a, a, a backdrop that has never been seen historically with interest rates at 0% for three years, with the world banking system on the verge of collapse, with the monetary union the size of the uh, European Union. Uh, experiencing huge problems and bank runs within uh, certain areas of Europe, I think uh, you're dealing with a lot of uncharted territory, and I think that means you got to be uh, paying attention here. So otherwise, you could be in cash, and I think that's fine too. Uh, for those of you who are not obsessive compulsive as we are, but anyways, on that note, everyone, thanks for listening. Hope you had a good time today. I know I did, Dr. K. I think you did too. Anyways, we'll catch you guys later. Take care. So long, everyone. <laughs>